with our Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5, it is now my privilege to read to you verses 1 through 20. Verses 1 through 20, by way of introduction to this series and the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching. May he bless the preaching of his own word. That's his sermon. Law or grace. And if it's a little bit of a mix between each ingredient, how much is needed? Why does Trinity Fellowship preach the gospel so much? Isn't it dangerous to spend so much time preaching on grace? If the preacher is always talking about the gospel and the unconditional grace of God towards sinners, won't that produce, in effect, individuals who take advantage of and turn into license to sin this, this gospel, this grace? Rather, what we need is probably a good mix of grace and plenty of threats. Yes, of course, we should tell people that Jesus died for their sins. But remember, if you don't obey all these rules, you're going to hell. Doesn't telling people about God's love just rock them to sleep spiritually? There's gospel. When short, the answer is yes. And no. Yes, for the unconverted heart, the free grace of God simply produces a license to sin. But no, not in the heart of a genuine Christian. In the heart of a genuine Christian, free grace produces a faith and a love and a treasuring of Jesus that loves to follow him, loves to obey him. When you observe the free grace of the gospel, not producing that love, not producing that affection in the life of an individual, well then, behold the fake Christian. When a man or woman constantly needs threats in order to obey, then really what we're observing is that they are obeying in order to receive grace, in order to receive mercy, rather than the fact that they've been saved so that they obey. Well, that's law. And everywhere in the New Testament, we find that by the works of the law, no one will be saved. Rather, the overarching pattern of the New Testament is to hold out Christ Jesus to the people, hold out Christ Jesus to God's people, and because of the free grace that we find in that person, we delight to obey him. I've been saved from my sins. I no longer want to live in my sins because he saved me from my sins. The real Christian is one who does not have to choose between a God of grace or a God of law because in Christ they have already received, received both the God of grace and the God of law. Because we broke the law of God, because we broke the law of the God of justice, because we sinned against the God who loves his law, designed his law, his law is an extension of who he is, what's inside of him. Because we sinned against that God, that God, the judge, crushed his own son at the cross as a substitute in our place. His justice, the justice of that lawful God, was served. 
And now he wins us in a way we never could have been won by his grace. In the process, he gives us a new heart that loves him, the God who created the law, who is also the God of grace. And with this new heart, we cherish him and we live to obey him. We desire to obey him. If you are my friends, you will keep my commands. In the Sermon on the Mount, we see the characters, characteristics that are produced by free grace. We see certain characteristics, the characteristics of a genuine, that means a real versus a fake Christian, a real, a genuine believer versus a false believer. Why? How? Because the kingdom of heaven is breaking and is breaking into our hearts and, and, and changing us. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's what's happening here. Heaven is breaking into hearts. And this morning, I am enthusiastically enthralled that we begin to, uh, this new series, a new series through the Beatitudes. It is our intention to study chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, over the next 12 weeks. And in this series, we're going to learn something that is crucial to the life of the church, crucial to the life of the individual Christian. What we're going to learn, and specifically what we're going to see today in the introduction to this series, is that because the kingdom of God has broken into the heart of a genuine Christian, there will be very specific characteristics produced in the Christian's life. If the kingdom of heaven is breaking into hearts, there will be evidence. Paul Washer gives the example of this in the consideration of a man who gets hit by an 18-wheeler. To contextualize, we could say an Azuzu. Can you imagine your co-worker saying, you know, I'm sorry I'm late today. I got hit by an Azuzu. It ran me over. But I'm fine now. Here I am. You would say, friend, you are lying. You didn't get hit by an Azuzu. There's not a mark on you. You're lazy and you're late. Well, we can say something similar. If heaven itself has broken into your heart, friend, there's going to be some evidence. There will be a heart change. You will be destroyed and you'll be rebuilt in the image of Christ. Our outline this morning looks like this. This sermon is going to serve as an introduction for an overview of the Beatitudes. And our outline is going to consist of four observations from our text as a whole, but most specifically towards the Beatitudes. Four observations from our text. Observation number one, what is the context of the Beatitudes? Observation number two, what is the structure of the Beatitudes? Point number three, what is the main idea of the Beatitudes? And then we will end with some general application for, the, uh, for these Beatitudes as we prepare to begin studying the very first one next week. So let's start with observation number one. What is the context of this new series we're about to start. Let's start by asking the question, who is the author? Well, the author is none other than precious Jesus, our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus, creator and redeemer, Jesus Christ. Verse 2 reads, he opened his mouth and taught this opening of Christ's mouth to teach is the first of five extended teachings found in Matthew's gospel. And it was originally given the title of the Sermon on the Mount by the African theologian Augustine, who I believe Emmanuel introduced you to last week. Well, that's a, a rather fitting title. Because as you'll see in verse 1, this extended sermon took place upon a mountain. Our Lord Jesus Christ 
is qualified to preach this sermon, not because he was ordained in any denomination. You won't find him at Muluwango. You won't find him at Sovereign Grace. You won't find him at MKC. You won't find him at, at Kalahewit. No. He was not ordained in any den denomination. Nevertheless, he's the best of preachers. Why? Because he is the king come incarnate for the sins of his people, including those he would gift to his church as preachers. And therefore, this preacher is the king of all preachers. This shepherd is the king of all shepherds. He is the greatest of shepherds because he is the good shepherd. And it's the explicit desire of Matthew that as we sit under Christ's preaching, he's the authority, not us. And I'll be preaching that way. He's the authority, not us. As we sit, it is Matthew's desire, as we sit under Christ's preaching, that we always remember the identity of the one who is preaching to us. In other words, what that means is that the cross must always loom large over every word Jesus utters. There is nothing said in the Sermon on the Mount that does not come under the shadow of the cross. And so we must never read a single word outside of the context of Christ crucified, crucified upon a cross for sinners. Sinners who would. Sinners who could never save themselves. It would be heretical, and I know what that word means. It's thrown around a lot. It would be heretical to interpret even one word of this sermon as divorced from a salvific relationship with its author. Indeed, Matthew himself frames the entirety of Christ's mission, including this sermon. In chapter 1, verse 21, this is his introduction to his grand gospel. He writes that the angel that came to tell Joseph about this baby that's on the way, the, the angel commanded Joseph to name his son Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. That's your hermeneutic for the gospel according to Matthew. So as we hear Christ preaching to us, as these words, as it were, drip like honey from his mouth, and as we endeavor to catch and savor every single drip, drop from the honeycomb of our beloved Savior's mouth, it will become sweeter and sweeter as we remember whose mouth from which it is dripping. And what he has, is, and will do to save us. Here in the Beatitudes, we have the chance to come and listen to the greatest of all preachers. Unlike every other preacher, Christ is a physician of the soul who even at this very moment, right here, right now, knows the hearts of all 8 billion men and women in this world, including all of you in this room. John 4.20, the disciple says, Come, see a man who told me all the things that ever I did. This morning, we begin a sermon that was declared 2,000 years ago, and yet this sermon, it is still speaking. Christ is still addressing us through the power of the Holy Spirit and the doctrine of inspiration. This sermon, it is still alive. It was at first declared on a mountain, 
This morning it is declared in Addis Ababa. What a way to start a new year, my brothers, my sisters. What a way to start a new year. Christ addressing us every single Sunday. And this sermon, it is every bit alive. It is every bit relevant right now as it was 2,000 years ago. Indeed, to the, to the decree, to the degree in which this word is declared by the preacher up here, Christ himself is preaching today and he is holding himself out to each one of you. He holds himself out individually and he says, will you take of me? 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 Please take of me. Listen to me. Will you take of me? Christ wants to meet with each one of you and say, take of me. I'm found here in this word. I come for you. I'm here for you. I bled for you, and this morning I preach to you. Christ is preaching. And unlike all the other preachers, he's the most successful of preachers. Jesus is the only preacher whose word has the ability to convert. And if I may speak from personal experience, I, as one who joins you in coming under this word, I know of no other portion of scripture more powerful than this. It is in, in, its, in, in its instantaneous ability to both reveal your own inner poverty and then supernaturally produce what you are lacking. Oh my God. You should be on the edge of your seats with faith. The context is that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is preaching. He is still preaching here. He's still preaching to us now. Let us gather around the author of life, who is the author of this sermon. The second consideration of this sermon's context, first is its author. The second consideration of this sermon's context is the coming or the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. In Matthew 4, 17, we're informed Jesus began his ministry by preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in 4, 23, Jesus is going throughout Galilee proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. That's where we find ourselves in this text. He's going throughout Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Considering the Beatitudes, we observe they both begin and end with a description of the citizens of this kingdom, this heavenly, God-owned, God-belonging to kingdom. In verse 3, the first Beatitude informs us that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those and only to those who are poor in spirit. And in the final Beatitude, verse 10 and 11 and 12 is, is an extension of verse 10. Verse 10 informs us that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are persecuted. My point is that the inbreaking of the kingdom is of major significance if we're going to understand the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Well, what is the kingdom of heaven? What does the inbreaking of the kingdom mean? We must be clear of this in so much of in the fact that it, it, it's important to Jesus. This is important to Jesus. So if we're going to understand a sermon, it must be important to us. Sinclair Ferguson gives us this helpful answer. Got a quote for you. Trying to follow in the footsteps of Imani and put it up. There we go. Look at that. What is the kingdom of heaven? And how has it come so near? The way in which the expression kingdom of heaven is interchanged with kingdom of God, those two expressions appear to mean exactly the same thing. The kingdom is the rule or reign of God, the expression of his gracious sovereign will. To belong to the kingdom of God, then, is to belong to the people among whom the reign of God has already begun. How can this be? Why is it that Jesus is able to say that the kingdom 
has already drawn near. Because Jesus himself is the king of God's kingdom. Where he reigns, there the kingdom of heaven is already present. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his commentary articulates three ways that we can actually see in the here and the now and then the future this breaking in. Firstly, he writes, whenever Jesus is present and exercising authority, wherever Jesus is present and exercising authority, the kingdom of heaven was there. Secondly, the kingdom of God is present at this moment in all who are true believers, in the hearts of those who have submitted to Christ and in whom he reigns, we who recognize Christ as our Lord and in whose lives he is reigning and ruling at this moment are in the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of heaven is in us. That should be the most amazing thing to you about yourself if you're a Christian. That's remarkable. God in you. Thirdly, as with all the Beatitudes, there is this already not yet sense of the kingdom. Lloyd-Jones writes, there is a sense in which it is yet to come. It has come. It is coming. It is yet to come. We are going to experience this not yet element of the kingdom coming when we are together with Christ in glory. And the context of this inbreaking of the kingdom is crucial to recognize because as we're going to see momentarily, the Beatitudes are in large part a description of the characteristics of the citizens of that kingdom. The third piece of context is false religion. That's our third contextual element. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is regularly comparing true religion to false religion. In other words, Jesus is exposing the false religion of the Pharisees who had an external religion. Another way to say this is that Jesus is comparing and contrasting the true Christian with the false or the fake one. The fake one also will be standing before Jesus on the last day saying, Lord, Lord the real one, we'll be calling him Lord as well. How can we distinguish? That's what Christ's context is helping us with. Because the religion of the Pharisees, it was outward. It was external for others to see. They prayed their long prayers. They tithed so that everybody could see. I want you to compare that with the inward heart patterns found in the Christian, which are so real that they become manifested. So Jesus doesn't say, you should be. This is what you should be like. He says, you are. If you've been regenerate, friends, you are. I'm not a good evangelist. I'm not a good preacher. You are, he says, salt and light. You cannot hide who you are. Not ultimately if you're a Christian. You see, it's so easy for us to throw stones at the Pharisees. But listen. Listen. Who do you think is most in danger of becoming one of these Pharisees? You. Me. We are. They're the ones with the sound theology. They're the ones who believed in the supernatural. They were the continuationists of their day. They were the ones who memorized their Bibles. And yet, they couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't see their own sinfulness. They couldn't trust. They couldn't truly trust in the good news of the gospel. So what did they do? They made rules. Here's a bunch of rules. that if you follow them, you're a real Christian. You're in the club. That is not a danger to those outside the church. That's a very, very real threat to the members of Trinity Fellowship. There is 
for each one of us a very real danger of losing sight of the free grace of God. We tend to gravitate, don't we, towards laws and structures for safety. Yeah, I know we're gospel-centered, but why don't you make this rule? What's, what's your position on that? Trinity Fellowship needs a position on that. I mean, I know you're gospel, but like that guy does that thing. You want to add all these laws to the free grace of God. We like these Pharisees say we believe in a God of grace, but then our actions and our idols betray that we have actually become the children of a lesser God. A lowercase g, God of our own, creating, fantasizing. The fourth and final contextual element that we must consider is the sermon's audience. Who is the audience? And our text, the immediate audience, is quite clear. When Christ sat down, verse 1 says, his disciples came near. Christ's immediate audience consisted of his disciples. Certainly the crowds gathered as well. They listened on. They watched on. They were listening in on this sermon, but this was a sermon that they were listening in on that was meant for the disciples who gathered around him. Disciple means follower. Every word in this sermon is meant to be heard by those who are already, hear me clearly, every word in this sermon is meant to be heard by those who are already believers or disciples. John Stott wrote that this sermon is the nearest thing to a manifesto that Jesus ever uttered, for it is his own description of what he wanted his followers to be and do. And it has been recorded for us as believers because all disciples of Christ everywhere have been commanded to make disciples and teach them to obey all that Jesus commanded. We find that here in this text, here in this sermon. This is what the Christian is supposed to be and do. Ferguson agrees, writing, As it was for those who first heard it, so it remains for us today. The manifesto of Jesus, his public declaration of his policy in the kingdom of God. Christ's audience informs us how we are to interpret these Beatitudes. Let me put it in the negative. Here's what the Beatitudes are not. These verses are not meant to be applied to governments. I've regularly heard politicians reference the Beatitudes as something of a vision for their nation or what a nation is meant to be and how state policy should be established. That's not Jesus' intention here. He's not telling Ethiopia how to run their government. It's not his goal. Nor is this sermon declared so as to establish a generally good principle for mankind. These are good principles. Buddhists can do this, Muslims can do this, we we can all do this and we're going to be better off. Nor are these meant to be just practical examples. Practical wisdom on how to live life. That's in no way Christ's intention. I'm taking these classes for this program up in Wales. And and I I went up to Wales a couple weeks ago. That's why I was gone. And I, I stopped in this shop and I started evangelizing to this older woman. And I said, I want to warn you, what I'm going to say is going to offend you. Because Jesus says, we're a bunch of sinners who need him as a savior. And she said, I, I, I don't really like that. I think that Christianity is really just a bunch of good examples, the teachings of Jesus on how to love each other. And I said, well, you're actually quite wrong. What the, what the Christianity is teaching, what Jesus taught us, is that nobody's good, not even one, except him. He's the second Adam. He's the start over of God. He's the only salvation. We go to him for salvation. It would be wrong to push upon the rest of the world our Christian ideals. 
and say, this is how it has to be. Nor is this Sermon on the Mount a sort of law that if you approach it and fulfill it, then God will save you. Friend, it would be utter malpractice to ask anyone, anyone of the world, anyone who is lost to obey or to conform to these beatitudes. That would be wrong. Lloyd-Jones says, it is wrong to ask anybody who is not first a Christian to try to love or practice the Sermon on the Mount. To expect Christian conduct for, from a person who is not born again is heresy. What is of supreme importance is that we must always remember that the Sermon on the Mount is a description of character and not a code of ethics or of morals. It is not to be regarded as law, a kind of new Ten Commandments or set of rules and regulations which are to be carried out by us, but rather as a description of what we Christians are meant to be. It is as if our Lord says, because you are what you are, that is how you will face the law and how you will live. So the recognition that Christ's immediate context consisted of those who were already disciples, it is crucial in coming to a conclusion on how we are to interpret this text and its main theme. But before we consider that theme, let's move from our first observation of this sermon's context to our second observation, which is its structure. We've seen the context of the author, the kingdom of heaven, the false religion of the Pharisees, and the immediate audience. Now let's consider its content or its structure. Observation number two, the structure of the Beatitudes. The first thing we notice about the Beatitudes structure is that they serve as an introduction to the entirety of Christ's Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't really matter if you think the Beatitudes consist of eight, nine, or ten. For the sake of mapping out this series, we will be preaching them in a series of approximately nine, eight or nine, considering verses 11 and 12 to be an extension of verse 10. And the main idea is to recognize that verses 3 through 12 are by and large descriptions or characteristics of the citizen of God's kingdom and the blessings that accompany that citizenship. The promises, the gospel promises, you might say. From there, in verses 13 through 16, we observe the Christian's character in the world. The Christian is salt. You are salt. You are light. And then finally, in verses 17 through 20, we have the Christian compared to the false religion, the false conversion of the Pharisees. And we're told that the Christian's righteousness is to exceed, it is to pass that of the scribes and Pharisees. From here, the remainder of Christ's sermon from chapter 5, verse 21 on to 727, where we're informed the sermon ends, we find this portion is more or less comparing and contrasting the commands of true religion to the practices of the false religion. You have heard it said, my religion, what I say. In this sermon series, we're only going to be considering the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount with very special focus, emphasis on the Beatitudes. The second thing that we must notice about the structure is that these beatitudes are grace-centered. The center of the tire, the center of the wheel, the spoke, it's all going, all the spokes, they're going to that centerpiece. That centerpiece is grace. I'm curious, when we began, or when you heard we were beginning a series on the Beatitudes, did you think, oh, okay, we're, okay, oh, oh, okay, all right, remember, gotta go, beginning a member, on, a series on the law. I imagine some of you thought that this would be a series on Christ's commands, but when you consider the structure the very first word of Christ's glorious sermon. Look at your text. What is it? Say it together. Blessed. 
It reads blessed. Now, preachers go to great lengths to construct introductions that are going to captivate you and keep you for the next 30 minutes to an hour. Stay in your mind, help you to remember afterwards. And here, the author of life, who is the author of this sermon, the very first word given by Christ Jesus in this sermon to his disciples is the word blessed, blessed. Puritan Thomas Watson wrote, Christ does not begin his Sermon on the Mount as the law was delivered on the Mount with commands and threatenings, the trumpet sounding, the fire flaming, the earth quaking, the hearts of the Israelites too for fear. But our Savior begins with promises and blessings. Bless, blessed, that's a word, friends, that we have to be very careful to protect and preserve its meaning because it can quite easily come to mean absolutely nothing in our hearts. It's used culturally everywhere. Achoo! Bless you. Blessings when you sign your email. Blessings, Pastor Michael. Oh, you need something? Bless you. You did something to help me, bless you. You gave me some money on the street, bless you. But practically speaking, and we all live like this, especially those of us in the city, those blessings, that blessedness, that's practically worthless in our world, isn't it? You guys, I, bless, I, I sneezed earlier in a meeting, and Emmanuel told me, bless you. I'm blessed. I'm blessed, you guys. I'm so excited. You never see that. That's because nobody cares. If Emmanuel doesn't say bless you, I might say, he's rude. Now don't read your cultural baggage, the cultural baggage of this word into Jesus' word. Because structurally, blessed is the word that Jesus uses to introduce his sermon. And structurally, it's a word that he repeats again and again. Each of the blessings finds its home in a promise. So what does the word blessed mean? Well, in short, the word blessed means to be divinely happy. Divinely happy. Blessed brings with it a, a reason for congratulations. Congratulations, my friend. This is a celebration of grace. You are divinely happy. It is a divine God-given happiness so that we say divinely happy are the poor in spirit. And as we go through this series, we will discover that with each of these blessings, there's an already not yet element to them. There is an immediate or instantaneous element to each of these blessings that the Christian is already right now experiencing. And yet at the same time, there is a not yet element to these blessings with the, which the Christian will not experience in full until he is in heaven with Jesus Christ. But with each blessing, the blessedness, what you must see, it is God-given blessedness. This is life face to face with God. This is feet to feet. There he is. There I am. I'm getting the blessing from him. This is intimate relationship with God, front and center. Here the Christian comes face to face with Almighty God, and what he experiences is the love of God, a perfect love which banishes, a perfect love which casts out, a, 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 a perfect love that throws as far as the east is from the west, a perfect love, a blessedness that casts out all fear. And as a result, the Christian's blessed right here, right now. The third consideration of structure reveals that each of these Beatitudes consists of the same formula. In other words, each of the Beatitudes begins with an articulation of blessing, followed by a characteristic, and then it ends with a reason for the original blessedness. 
two notes on this formula on how it should be interpreted. Firstly, the blessing is not primarily found in the characteristic. Does that make sense? For example, the blessing is not primarily in being poor in spirit. Not primarily. Rather, the blessing is found in being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, the blessing is not being received because of that spiritual characteristic. In other words, the characteristic does not merit or deserve the blessing. Let me show you what I mean. Look with me at, the, at verse 7, which is the fifth beatitude, which reads, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we interpret this to mean the person who is merciful is blessed because now he deserves and will receive mercy from God, well, we've just stopped being evangelicals. We've stopped being Protestants. We've totally destroyed the doctrine of justification by the free grace of God as found in the person of Christ Jesus and him crucified for sinners. In other words, we've just lost good news. Mercy by definition, by definition, is not receiving the consequences we deserve. By definition, in other words, mercy cannot be earned. You cannot earn mercy. It wouldn't be mercy anymore. You'd have to stop calling it. You can call it something else. Compensation. It's not mercy. So when we consider the formula of these beatitudes, we cannot say the blessing is deserved because of the existence of the characteristic. Rather, the correct interpretation looks like this. The poor in spirit are blessed because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Those who are merciful are blessed because they shall receive mercy. Those who are pure in heart are blessed for they shall see God. They're blessed because they're going to see God. And only the poor ones, only the merciful ones, only the meek ones, only the pure in heart, and we'll get to what that is, have that promise. As we consider the genius of Christ's formula, we also notice that there is a paradoxical nature to these beatitudes. The poor are the ones that are blessed because the kingdom belongs to them. The one who mourns, the crying one, the weeping one, is the one who is comforted. It's the meek or the gentle. Not the United States government, not the Russian government, not the North Korean government, not the Chinese government, not the strong, not the Ethiopian government. No, no, no. It's the meek. It's the gentle. Not the great militaries of the world who are the ones who will inherit the world. Seems like a paradox. Seems like a contradiction. And this formula, it's, it's repeated over and over again. The last observation of the Beatitudes structure is that each Beatitude, it builds upon the others. In Christ's structure, none of these Beatitudes can stand alone. We're going to see more of this as we consider the theme. But for now, the one who is poor in spirit, they recognize their poverty, and in turn, such a one necessarily mourns. They see their poverty, and what do they do? Because they're impoverished, spiritually impoverished, they grieve, they mourn. And the one who mourns, rather than being bombastic and demanding necessarily, becomes meek. And in his poverty and in his mourning, such a, such a one necessarily hungers and thirsts after righteousness. I have nothing. I'm grieving. I'm, I'm weeping over my, my lack, my poverty. And, and now you did something to me, but I realize what I did against him is far more than anything you're going to do against me. And so I become gentle towards you. I'm gentle. I'm meek. And now you've sinned against me. I'm going to be merciful. Because, oh my God, he's been merciful towards me. 
And right down the list it goes. And you can't have one without any of the others. It's a whole package. They build upon each other. And this formula, it's crucial to Christ's argument because each beatitude, it's, it's building something. It's building a structure. It's building what the Christian looks like. This is what it looks like. Not the finished Christian, not the one now in heaven, the one here, the one now. You cannot pick and choose as from a buffet which beatitudes you most enjoy. The beatitudes, they're a spiritual package. And you cannot truly, from the heart, have some of these beatitudes without the whole. If you're truly poor in spirit, you will become truly merciful. Even if it's just in seedling form. This brings me to observation number three. Observation number three is that the main point of these beatitudes are the characteristics of a genuine Christian. Shouldn't be a surprise at this point. And that main theme is going to inform the entirety of the rest of this series. The title of this sermon series is The Beatitudes, The Characteristics of a Genuine Christian. Well, how did we come to this interpretation? Well, I would hope by now that after considering both the context and the content or the structure, that answer is clear. But in short... To recap, Christ began his ministry saying that the kingdom of heaven was breaking into the world. What does it look like when the kingdom of heaven breaks in? Christ is preaching the kingdom to his own disciples and the Beatitudes begin and end with a description of the characteristics of those who belong to the kingdom of God. What is more, throughout the entirety of this sermon, Jesus is preaching to those who relate to God as their father and we know that it's only those who the Spirit gives crying out, Abba Father, who have been adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High. These are the characteristics of what it looks like for someone to be a genuine Christian from the heart. Moving forward, therefore, this sermon series will primarily focus on those characteristics found right in the middle of each beatitude. Why is this so important? Here's why this is important. Because each one of us approaches the Christian life with this certain picture, whether we share it or not, of what a Christian looks like and or what he does not look like. Perhaps the Orthodox would emphasize fasting. If you want to be really serious, you got to fast. Perhaps the Pente, I'm I'm, I'm painting in broad strokes at this point, but perhaps the Pente might emphasize emotions, and evangelizing while abstaining from things like alcohol and dancing. And depending upon your respective denominations that you may have come from, you might have different emphases as to what a real Christian looks like. If you were raised in sovereign grace, Muluwongo, Makana Jesus, there's probably going to be some different emphases that you think this is what it looks like to be a Christian. But in our text, we have the most important word. Christ is informing us what a genuine Christian looks like. Here with Jesus, it's time for us to put down our preconceived ideas. And here it's time to listen at his feet. Because on the last day, he, the one who is sitting while he addresses us, will say to many, many, many people in this city, away from me, I never knew you. Here in this text, we find certainty as to whether or not we are citizens of the kingdom. Here we discover whether or not we know and see God and are known as his sons and daughters. So what does genuine Christianity look like? These are the characteristics of the Christian. These are characteristics found beginning in his heart. All Christians look like this. All Christians are to be marked by 
all these characteristics. We can talk about culture. We can talk about language. We can talk about urban people and countryside people. But all Christians everywhere will be characterized by all these characteristics. The genuine Chinese Christian. The genuine Sudanese Christian. The American. Yes, God saves Americans. The Mexican. The Canadian. The South African Christian. Each one will look like this, maybe in his own language, maybe with his own culture, but these will be the defining characteristics of the Christian. The Amara and the Oromo alike, the Tigray, the Grage, the Somali alike. City Christians, countryside Christians, these are the characteristics of all genuine Christians everywhere. If you're a genuine Christian, then these characteristics will be in you. And here's what's of supreme importance. These characteristics, they can only be produced by the new birth. What Emmanuel preached to us last week. My great fear is that you interpret these spiritual realities as natural or attainable through your practice, through your endeavors, through your work, through your spiritual practices, your spiritual disciplines, through your culture. Within our culture... We have this toe in it. And as as a foreigner who's come in, who loves your culture and identifies with many parts of it, I want to say, I think that's really pretty. I think it's beautiful. But that's not the meekness found in our text. The student who's soft-spoken. The teenager who's quiet. Around his elders. That's not what Jesus is talking about in the text. These are, not, these are not characteristics your culture can train you or teach you. These are, not, these are not characteristics that you can be born with. They're not natural temperaments. And we Christians, we often make the mistake of identifying natural temperaments. Oh, he's so quiet. He's so humble. Not, not according to God. Look at Martin Lloyd-Jones. I think I have this quote on the, on the screen. I find this to be of massive importance. This quote has helped me so much. It's an extended one. It reads, People are often in difficulty about this. They say, I know a person who does not claim to be a Christian, never goes to a place of worship, never reads the Bible, never prays, and frankly tells us he is not interested in these things at all. But you know, I have a feeling that he is more of a Christian than many people who do go to a place of worship and who do pray. He's always nice and polite, never says a harsh word or or expresses an unkind judgment, and is always doing good. Such people look at certain characteristics in the person they are considering and say, there are the Beatitudes, obviously staring me in the face. This person must be a Christian, though he denies the entire faith. That is the kind of confusion that often arises through failure to be clear at this particular point. In other words, it will be our business to show that what we have here in each individual case is not a description of a natural temper. It is rather a disposition that is produced by grace. Take this man who by nature appears to be such a fine Christian. If that is really a condition or a state which conforms to the Beatitudes, I suggest it is quite unfair, for it is a matter of natural temperament. Now, a man does not determine his natural temperament. You you know what he's talking about, personality. Though he governs it up to a point. Some of us are born aggressive. Others are quiet. Some are alert and fiery. Others are slow. We find ourselves as we are, and these nice people who are so frequently brought forward as an argument against the evangelical faith are in no sense responsible for being like that. The explanation of their condition is something biological. It has nothing to do with spirituality and nothing to do with man's relationship to God. It is purely animal and physical. As people differ in their physical appearance, so they differ in temperament. And if that is what determines whether a man is Christian or not, I say it is totally unfair. These characteristics 
are given only in the new birth. There are only two types of people in this world. Those that have been born again and those that have not. Those are the only two realms and the Christian and the non-Christian, they belong to two entirely different realms though they live in the same world. Last week, I asked Emmanuel to preach a sermon on regeneration. And that was very intentional. The reason is because regeneration and only regeneration produces these characteristics in the heart of a Christian. And so that was meant to serve as something of a preface to the introduction to this series. The word generate means this. To generate is to create. Think Genesis, first book of the Bible. Origin, creation. To regenerate is to recreate. It is a new creation. This theological word comes from Christ's teaching on being born again. I was born, I'm born again. Just as you played no role in being born, you play no role in being born again. In your physical creation or birth, your parents conceived you and your mother birthed you. When you're born again, you are conceived of the Spirit. And you are birthed of the Spirit, given spiritual birth. It is not a decision you make to be born again, but a decision that God and His sovereignty makes. And until He does... You are so spiritually dead, according to John 3, that you cannot even see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He's blind. And so to be explicitly clear, the teaching of the New Testament is that regeneration precedes faith. Regeneration, being born again, comes before faith. Last week, Amani asked you, how did you come to Jesus? And then he gave to us this definition of regeneration. He said, regeneration is the sovereign and miraculous work of the Holy Spirit that creates a new heart in the sinner, which desires. See that? Choosing to be, chosen to be choosing. Desires and responds to the gospel with faith and repentance. He pointed out that because of sin and spiritual death, man has an utter inability to come to Christ. But through regeneration, God miraculously works to bring lost man to Christ for salvation. Well, in the Beatitudes, we read the characteristics, if you will, of this new heart. These characteristics that the Holy Spirit works in us, they serve as the mechanisms, the mechanics, if you will, on how God brings a person to Jesus and keeps such a one in Jesus. The Spirit produces these characteristics through giving you a new heart. Here's what I mean to show you. Before someone can hear the good news of the gospel, they must see, they must hear the reality of the bad news. The bad news is that they are sinners. The bad news is that God is angry with them. What is more, they cannot do anything to clean up their lives or to fix themselves. One sin is enough to damn you to eternity, but you have a sinful nature. You can't make things right. Therefore, you are under the wrath of God. Such news, when truly understood, it produces what? Poverty. Spiritual poverty. Poverty of spirit. You realize you are poor and you cannot pay God back. The debts you owe are too great. As a result, one begins to mourn their sin. They don't just know intellectually that they are sinners. They are experiencing something. They feel they are sinners and they mourn. They grieve for their sin against a holy and loving God. Such a person by, necess by necessity will become meek. They will become gentle for they know exactly what they are apart from grace. Sinners who deserve judgment. I have nothing special in me, they say. And yet God loved me. 
And from that meekness, the Christian becomes a merciful man and a merciful woman. How could such a one go from begging and weeping over their sin to always being angry and blaming others? There are so many people who are so hard on themselves and at heart, this is the reason. They're not poor in spirit. They're always beating themselves up. And it looks like pride, but the reality, it looks like humility, but in reality, it's pride. They don't realize there's nothing they can do to pay God what they owe. As a result, they're surprised by their own sin. They don't truly know themselves. When they're doing poorly in their Christian life, they come across as humble, saddened. But when they're doing well, they're very judgmental people. Always giving you a hard time. Always tearing you down. Always telling you you need to pick yourself up and get going. There's a time and place for that, but it's not the majority of the Christian life. In actuality, that's religiosity. It's not the religion of the regenerate heart, but of the Pharisee. And Jesus is contrasting that with the Christian. This is often the sign of an unregenerate, dead religious heart, which has never truly seen the glory of the free grace as found in the face of Jesus Christ. The only thing we contribute to our salvation is our sin. And friend, that produces poverty, mourning, humility, meekness, mercy. My great fear in a room of this size is the danger of an unregenerate heart. To use layman's terms, my great fear is that many people in this room at this very second think they're Christians, but you're not born again. There will be many of you who think that you are a Christian because you were born in a Christian home, because you said the sinner's prayer, because you walked the aisle during an altar call, let me speak to my camp. There will be reformed people in this room who think they are saved because of their right views. I got the right picture. I know God's sovereign. I know the doctrine of justification. But the problem is you've never been born again. You don't have the inner workings. You don't have the inner graces born in you of the Spirit. You've not had an inner experience. You haven't had an inner experience. Like the Pharisees, it's all just on the outside. And the fact that you are still dead in your trespasses and sins is exposed in that these characteristics, they are not evident in your life. Yes, you have outward Christianity. No, you don't have the inner work of the Spirit. But there is good news. The preacher of this sermon, he is both able to show you your own poverty and in, a, in an instant produce in you what you lack. Jesus and only Jesus can save you. The only response to anything I will say for the next 12 weeks is this. Nothing, nothing, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply Jesus Christ to your cross I cling. I come naked. I come needy. I come wanting you. And we end with this very short application. What shall we do? How shall we listen? As Christ preaches. Number one, don't use this opportunity, this, this series as an opportunity to think, if I do these things, God will save me. I have to work harder to produce these things in me. I really need to work. I really need to focus. If you read these Beatitudes as demands, you miss the preacher's point and you do it to your own eternal damnation. 
Martin Lloyd-Jones commented on this series. We are not told in the Sermon of the Mount, live like this and you will become a Christian. Rather, we are told because you are a Christian, live like this. The New Testament preaches free grace and the ordering is of utmost importance. That ordering is this, because I am saved by the free grace of God, I love to obey him. False religion says, I obey. It reverses the order. I obey to receive blessing. I obey to receive favor. I obey to receive salvation. I obey to receive assurance of my salvation. Damn that. False religion to the bottom pits of hell. Do not do that, my dear friends, with these be attitudes. Don't do it. But instead, do this. Examine yourself as to whether these characteristics are in you, even in seedling form. If they are, praise God. He has given you a new heart. You stand in awe of yourself, not yourself, but the grace of God in yourself. You stand in awe of your life, recognizing everything I've got is a blessing from Jesus. No room for pride. A few weeks ago, during our dating series, I told the church, I told the men of this church, told all of you that I think the, the, the women are more, more mature than the men. What did you do with that? Sisters, if you're boasting about that, if you rub that in any man's face, you don't realize what you are by grace. You should get on your knees and pray for every last man in this church. And my brothers, if you felt crushed, you still don't understand grace and what God is calling you to become, become by free grace and what his promises will empower you to become a man of God. We are, each of us, what we are by grace. If, however, in your examining of yourself, you come to realize that these qualities are not in you, then you must realize you are still dead in your trespasses and sins. And the only thing to do is to cry out to Jesus, not the idea of Jesus, not a sinner's prayer, not an altar call. You go straight to Jesus. And oh, by the way, you can do that before this sermon is over. And as an ambassador of Christ, I call upon each one of you everywhere in this room right now. Look on Jesus Christ. And I promise you, I guarantee you with the promise of God himself, you will be saved. Hallelujah. Do it now. Do it now. Call upon him. He's never passed anybody who says, save me. Save me, I'm blind. Save me, I'm dead. Save me from my leprosy. Save me. He will stop. He will get down on his knee. Just don't stop crying out. Don't stop crying out until Jesus himself, not a pastor, not a pope, not a priest, Jesus himself grabs you by the hand and says, I am yours. You are mine. Number two, application number two, do not rush past the pain that will be inflicted in this series. There's so much blessing, there's so much joy Sometimes the way up is down. Some of you are going to come under great conviction and it will hurt. Do not rush to painkillers. Do not rush to comfort. I specifically want to warn the members of Trinity Fellowship to be slow to comfort those inflicted during this series. Jeremiah 6 warns each of us of false prophets who declare peace, peace when there is no peace. And as a result, heal lightly the wounds that God himself has inflicted. There's a real warning in this text for how God works. We can learn as a church. Even if we have the reality, we can continue to grow in the reality of this is how God works. This way is to put a man down before he lifts him up in salvation. But the key is you can't do that. I can't do that. The Pope can't do that, nor can a priest do that. No evangelist can do that, but only Jesus Christ who died on the cross for their sins you find somebody coming under conviction, don't comfort them. Point them to the only one who can truly comfort them. And finally, and I mean this especially to the members of this church, you are the sweetest place to me. I can't wait to be in eternity with you. 
for you, especially you. Pray for Jesus to help you to hear his voice throughout this series. In the Christian life, it's not enough to merely intellectually remind yourself of the gospel and the truths therein. Yes, you can teach. Yes, you can teach yourself to do that regularly. That is what we teach you. Remind yourself the gospel. But the Christian life is not merely intellectual. It's not merely cerebral. You must go to Jesus and you must spend time to Jesus. Are you talking to Jesus? Are you praying to Jesus? Are you listening to Jesus? Are you spending time with the preacher? Spend time with Jesus. Go to him in prayer. It is only in hearing from Jesus, telling you of your own poverty, that his word will produce in you what you lack, what you have very little of. Trinity Fellowship, let us examine ourselves and as a body run to Jesus.